Okay, good morning or good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're listening and watching. Um, I hope you're doing well. This is our continuation of the exploration of different instruments and uh, their various characteristics. So today we're looking at the French horn, which is sometimes called just the horn, sometimes the French horn, or often the horn in F. So let's look at some properties of the horn. Um, different languages, cor, corno, horn, horn and F, as we said. Um, if trumpet is the soprano member of the brass choir, then the horn would be the blank member. What do you think? Can you picture what role it might serve? Alto tenor. Alto because, well, it has quite a, a, a high range up to that F above the staff sounding but it also has quite a low range. Down to the, the F at the bottom of the bass staff. Really, this is covering the choir range. Uh, it's not very extreme, but uh, in terms of the orchestra, you could say it's, it's, it's operating in that mid register. Okay, written range, this is important. Make sure you are remembering the difference between the written and the sounding range, of course, uh, we've looked a little bit already at the English horn. You could think of it as related to the English horn in that um, it has the same transposition, so the sounding pitch will be a perfect bit lower. Uh, it's pretty easy to remember. You could think of it as from C to C, so written, written C on the bass staff. It's one octave, two octaves, three octaves up. Now that looks quite high, doesn't it? That high C. This is the advantage of, of having a transpose score is that when you see that high C, it looks high. And in fact, it is the, considered the highest note of the, of the French horn. But what's the resulting pitch? Of course, you're saying, ah, right, it's a perfect fifth lower. Okay, so the three octave range from low F to the F above uh, on the top of the treble staff. Okay, so that's quite a big range we've got. In fact, most horn players I know will specialize in either the high horn or the low horn. It's not to say all hornists do, but they tend to. Okay, for high school, of course, we have a, a more conservative range, not so high, not so low. Notice that I'm using the hourglass shape, and that's because this is how we should think of the dynamic curve. Hourglass. So we have the, the the middle register being naturally softer, the the outer most extremes a bit uh, a bit more pronounced. It would be hard to, of course, a, a true virtuoso might be able to play a, a pianissimo uh, high F, but mm, it would be very difficult. So you should think of it as more natural to to, uh, let's say, belt out those high notes. Okay, that can be a, a great effect. It is an instrument that is easily covered, uh, hence the reason why we have four of them. We often find in the orchestra that sometimes we, we double. We have two, three, or four horns. Wagner might have up to eight or 12, all playing the same line. And that's to balance out with the other uh, brass members of the, the choir. Um, that's not to say they, they always uh, are doubled. Often they're kind of an SATB format. Um, they do blend well. I think of the horn as a, an instrument that is gluing the different parts, different, different choirs together. It gets along really well with the, the woodwinds. Of course, it gets along with the brass. It is a brass instrument. And it blends well with the strings as well. You could, you could easily double, let's say, um, a viola line or a cello line, it, it fortifies something that's already there. Or it can provide support. Let's say you have a, uh, a flute melody up here, and let's say you want a nice a horn support in the mid register or lower register. Right, that would provide some nice support. So it can hold its own as well. Um, uh, these are good descriptors of the, the sound. We know the, the sound of the, the French horn already. Warm, expressive, certainly. And not particularly agile. And I, I will stress this point because 
I've tried to see where that line is as a composer. I'm, I'm constantly pushing for a little bit more. And it is an instrument where playing a single note or a few notes is just much more effective than leaping around and asking it to do too much. So you want to think of it a bit more conservatively. Uh, that's not to say they can't play impressive sounding passages, but that you want to make sure they're prepared well. For example, if you go into that high range, you might want to, to walk up instead of leaping up, right? Something like that would be difficult, but let's say you, you, right? Something like that would be very nice leading up to that high F. All right. Um, another thing I'll point out is that, yes, you can write staccatos, uh, fast notes, repeated, pa repeated passages. However, it won't c come out as crisp and clear as the piano makes it sound. Think of it more like wah, 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 and you'll get a little closer to uh, the, the resulting sound. It's not that they, they aren't producing a staccato, they're certainly tonguing a staccato, but the resulting sound going through all that tubing and coming out the other end um, in, out of their bell, well, it's going to be just a, a little bit uh, softened by the time it gets there. Um, leaps of more than one octave used sparingly. So a, a leap of an octave, if you prepare it well, can re be really useful. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. Once I did write for a, a high F, uh, this was for a youth orchestra, and I was this was the big climactic moment, and I really wanted this 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 note, and I thought I had prepared it well. Well, um, they they didn't tell me, but they 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 squeezed in a note right before really soft uh, for the whole horn uh, family um, so that they could they could achieve that high note. So they needed a little bit more preparation. That was a good learning experience for me as a composer that often if you, if you have those extreme high notes, well prepare it a bit. Try to try to picture, you know, it's it's analogous to let's say um, the high notes in a, for a soprano and unless you have a type of voice where you can uh, bounce around in the, the high range easily, well, probably you need some time to, to leap up, right? So some preparation is, is necessary. Okay, trills. There are two different types of trills, lips, lip trill versus valve trill. The valve trill, trill is the modern, um, it's, it's the modern technique. Of course, originally trumpets, horns, um, they, they were valveless, so they were doing everything using, using the, their embouchure. So it's analogous to, let's say, um, well, you know, between pressing, pressing the notes on a, on a piano, which is it's a little bit more, you know, let's say that's closer to a valve, versus singing a, a trill. Try singing a trill. It's, a, it's difficult to control. It would take some time. It would take some training to to um, to work out well how to oscillate between two pitches. So you can hear it's a bit more raw. It's a li it's a bit uh, less controlled. You might be looking for that sound. So in which case you could you could use the lip trill. The lip trill tends to be more for uh, it's historically accurate um, for older pieces. Or if you want that really raw in your face kind of trill, then then use that. Otherwise, if you write a trill, they'll, you, they'll play the valve trill. All right, there are some examples. Okay, now, um, as I already said, there are often high versus low players. In, in any orchestra, you'll usually have two of each. Um, and that's because we have, they, we have interlocking voices. So they'll be sitting one, two, three, four in order, but they'll be interlocked between one and three two and four and this is this is just traditionally done uh, so that you get a nice blend so in general if you're if you are writing for four horns which normally you are uh you should be you should be um splitting up splitting them up into two staves one is high horn one is low horn think about the the range too um low horn you know that's written c and e that would come out a fifth lower so in that case we didn't need to use the bass clap however you will see you will see sometimes that the low horn goes into the bass clef. Uh, remember, 
you know, they only have the written C, which comes out in F, so it's not all that low. So you'll often see the, the low horn oscillating between treble clef and bass clef. High horn, of course, will we'll mostly stick with treble clef. Okay, um, this is an old notation that, that comes up occasionally. Let's say you're looking at a, a Mozart or Beethoven uh, symphony or, um, it might, or something from the Romantic period. Um, and it can be confusing because you just learned, well, I thought the written notation was that you're not, that you can't go below that, the C below middle C, right? That's sounding an F below. Well, just to make things more complicated, the old notation, it would look an octave lower. So it's as if the bass clef would sound up a perfect fourth and the treble clef, clef would sound down a perfect fifth. Are you confused? You're not alone. Okay, this is not the convention anymore. So this is just for to let you know if you're looking at an old score and you're seeing very low notes and you're wondering, wait a moment, that, that's out of the range of the instrument. That's the reason why. Um, these days you should be writing uh, so that it's consistent between treble clef and bass clef. All right, so that it always sounds down a perfect fit. All right, I know everyone's head is spinning around right now because transposition is not easy. Um, but just know that, that that is a potential for confusion. Okay, here's a, a common figure, the horn fifths. Sounds almost like a cliche. I think it is. We've heard this, this sort of sound quite a bit. And, and that's because these are the natural overtones. Let's say you had horn in C, where C is the fundamental pitch. You'd have... Uh, think about your, your overtone series that you'd have the octave up, then the fifth, then the fourth, then the third. So th th here we're, we're using the notes from the overtone series, which makes a lot of sense when it comes to natural horn. Hence the development of the, this cliche. Okay, so there was an abbreviated tour of the horn, and we'll see how that the horn gets along with uh, in our woodwind quintet first, and then we'll, we'll start working it into our brass. Um, it is really a friendly instrument as long as you treat it well. It's just like you, a friend of yours. You want to treat your friends well, and they'll treat you well. Okay, there you have it. There, there's your, your friendly metaphor uh, for the day. Okay, I hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, again, be in touch if you have any questions. Take care.